Chapter Three of Mary, a Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Paul Gonzales. Chapter Three. Now her father's house lived a poor widow who had been brought up in affluence, but reduced to great stress by extravagance of her husband, who had destroyed his constitution while he spent his fortune, and dying, left his wife and five small children to live on a very scanty pittance. The eldest daughter was for some years educated by a distant relation, a clergyman, while she was with him a young gentleman, son to a man of property in the neighbourhood, took particular notice of her. It is true, he never talked of love, but then he played and sung in a concert, drew landscapes together, and while she worked, he read to her, cultivated her taste, and stole imperceptibly her heart. Just at this juncture, when smiling, an analyzed hope made every prospect bright, and gay expectation danced in her eyes, her benefactor died. She returned to her mother, the companion of her youth forgot her. They took no more sweet counsel together. This disappointment spread a sadness over her countenance, and made it interesting. She grew fond of solitude, and her character appeared similar to Mary's, though her natural disposition was very different. She was several years older than Mary, yet her refinement, her taste, caught her eye, and she eagerly sought for friendship. Before her return she had assisted the family, which was almost reduced to the last ebb, and now she had another motive to actuate her. As she had often occasion to send messages to Anne, her new friend, mistakes were frequently made, and proposed that in the future they should be written once, to obviate this difficulty, and render the intercourse more agreeable. Young people are mostly fond of scribbling. Mary had had very little instruction, but by copying her friend's letters, whose hand she admired, she soon became proficient. A little practice made her write with tolerable correctness, and her genius gave force to it, in conversation and in writing. When she felt she was pathetic, tender and persuasive, and she expressed contempt with such energy that few could strand the flash of her eyes. As she grew more intimate with Anne, her manners were softened, and she acquired a degree of quality in her behaviour. Yet still her spirits were fluctuating, and her movements rapid. She felt less pain on account of her mother's partiality to her brother, as she hoped now to experience the pleasure of being beloved. But this hope led her into new sorrows, and, unusual, paved the way for disappointment. Anne could only felt gratitude. Her heart was entirely engrossed by one object and friendship could not serve as a substitute. Memory officiously traced past scenes, and unveiling wishes made term loiter. Mary was often by the involuntary indifference which these consequences produce. When her friend was altered the world to her, she found she was not as necessary to her happiness, and her delicate mind could not bear to obtrude her affection, or receive love as an alms, the offspring of pity. Very frequently has she ran to her with delight, and not perceiving anything of the same kind in Anne's countenance, she has shrunk back, and, falling from one extreme into the other, instead of a warm greeting that was just slipping from her tongue, her expression seemed to be dictated by the most chilling sensibility. She would then imagine that she looked sickly or unhappy, and in all her tenderness would return like a torrent, and bear away all reflection. In this manner was her sensibility called forth, and exercised by her mother's illness, her friend's misfortunes, and her own unsettled mind. End of chapter 3 Recording by Paul Gonzalez in Cavita, Philippines